Okay. I think we're good to get this show on the road. Um, if So I want to thank everyone so, so much um, for joining us today. Um, thank you to the audience members for attending, for donating to the Black Trans or serving organizations that we wanted to spotlight. Um, thank you for the Disclosure Filmmakers, Teek Milan and Sam Fader for joining us. Um, special thanks to Teek because it is Teek's birthday today. Um, if anyone wants to drop birthday wishes in the chat. Um, and thank you, thank you all for coming here today um, to support Disclosure. Um, and so first off, I wanna go up to share um, our total fundraising amount, um, which was about, if I did the math right, which I'm an English major, so be nice to me, um, which was, we together we raised, in just one week, we were able to raise $324 um, for the three trans, black trans serving organizations, the OCA project, the Black Trans Travel Fund and the Homeless Black Trans Women GoFundMe. Um, and so um, if you are feeling extra generous in the, in the hour that we have you, then Tim will be dropping the link to those in the chat um, for anyone to find later. Um, and so going over a few Google Meet etiquette rules, um, please, if the audience members could all mute your mi video and microphone, um, and so you don't become our special guest of the evening, um, this this um, will this P Q and A will be recorded. And if you have any questions that pop up during this event, you can enter those into the chat box, and I will be checking that the chat box every now and then. Um, all right. And so last clearing house is that if you if you really enjoy what you see here tonight, um, we encourage you to get involved with um, Fulbright Prism and you can follow us on social media. You can follow Teek and Sam on social media, Twitter and Instagram, I believe. Um, and you may donate to any of, any of the organizations listed in the chat and if, you are a Fulbright um, alumni or current or future Fulbrighter, um, and you really want to get involved with us, you could start your own chapter. We have one in Taiwan and an upcoming one in on the US West Coast right now. And last one is to submit to the Fulbright Prism zine, um, the zines that we're working on collecting that are due July 24th. Um, and so that is all of, the announcements. Um, so without further ado, um, I want to introduce Teek and Sam. So um, Teek Milan served as a creative consultant for Disclosure and is featured prominently in the film, in the film as a public as a public speaker, thought leader, media consultant and writer. Teek shares his story of being transgender and how that informs his views on masculinity race, and gender. He travels through North America leading discussions on healthy modes of masculinity, inclusive leadership, and creating cultures of consent. He has lect lectured at several universities, including Harvard, Stanford, and Brown on the importance of inclusion as a tool for innovation, and he outlines concrete strategies for productive engagement. Some of his work includes the Death and Life of Marsha P. Johnson, a TED Talk called A Queer Vision of Love and Marriage, which is amazing and I highly recommend it to everyone. Um, and he, some other of his work has appeared in BuzzFeed, CNN, and Ebony. Um, Sam and Sam Fader is the director of Disclosure and has created several award-winning documentaries that center the intersection of race, class, sexuality, sexuality and conflict within the queer and trans community. Showing that our work, that our communal history makes our present lives possible. Sam's work explores the power dynamics and politics of media-driven identity by connecting transgender struggle, 
struggles and liberation to the context of the present and legacy of the past. Some of their work includes Kate Bornstein is a queer and pleasant danger, boy I, and boy I am. One of my favorite quotes by Sam is, qu quotes about Sam's work is the quote, Sam's work is putting urgent activist issues into a historical context. I apologize for the dog poking. Um, <laughs> so um, without further ado, um, I want to get this, get this started and with a quote that I, that I believe, let me grab this note I have. I believe Jen Richards said in the, in the film, um, that, quote, every trans person carries with them a history of trans representation and that they've sort of internalized. And so I want to ask y'all, um, what, what inspired y'all to dig into that history that you, that y'all carry and to tell that history? Uh, yeah, I can talk about why, what inspired the making of the film, and, and then I guess, Tiki, you could talk about why you wanted to be part of it. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, so, you know, there were two documentaries that, like, that really changed my relationship to the media. In 1987, there's a film called Ethnic Notions made by Marlon Riggs, and it's about the representation of Black people in film. And the other was a 1995 film called The Cellular White Closet, which is about gay and lesbian representation in film. And the ethnic notions really resonated with me and kind of changed my perspective of film and storytelling because it was really a history of, it was an American history of America. It was our history. And it was a way to look at our history through just, you know, turning the lens ever so slightly and suddenly this whole new history unfolds. And um, after seeing those two films and sitting with it and teaching it and making my own work, I always wanted, I always wondered what that, what a film like that would be for trans people and trans representations. Um, and then, you know, you sort of fast forward to 2014. At that point, I'd been making films for about 10 years and trans visibility was increasing and mainstream society was talking about us more than ever. And there were two things that I found really disconcerting about how the media uh, was insinuating that visibility is the goal for the trans movement and that trans people are something new. And so I felt really compelled to give trans and non-trans people a more context to understand these changes in our culture, um, to have a sense of the history, how we got to this point of visibility, but all while foregrounding the fact that visibility in itself is not the goal, it's a means to an end. Um, so I felt there was more to the story than what was being seen, uh, and I wanted to tell that story. Um, for me, okay, so first, the cellular closet, I saw that uh, when I was a kid, and I remember seeing it and loving it so much. And then, like every week after it, I would look at the TV guide. So this is back when the TV guide came in the newspaper that cut dropped off at your house every week. And looking through the TV guide, trying to find the cellular cost because it blew my mind. Um, and disclosure, kind of, I remember when um, Sam and Laverne and everybody reached out about being a part of the film, it did really remind me of that. And I was like, this is amazing because I thought cellular closet was just like legendary. Um, but for me. You know, part of the reason that I really wanted to be a part of this, um, because you know, I think that representation is important. Having intersectional representation is important, and this was an opportunity for me as a Black trans man to, um, you know, to represent myself and also to be able to speak to the importance of us um, being able to tell our stories and being represented in, in media in a way that is feels full and authentic. And I knew that. Um, being that you know, this was uh, so many trans people. I think all all trans folks who worked on this that this was going to be something that was going to be really moving and something like no one had seen before. So um, yeah, so that's why I decided to be to be a part of this. All right, and yeah, you, I think y'all bring up a good thing as far as pointing out trans people obviously existed far beyond just the media starting to give a spotlight. Um, and so I think some a quote that I really enjoyed was by Susan Stryker when Susan said, trans and cinema have grown up together and creating that parallel that um, this film sort of, that this film sort of proves. And so I'm curious, did you know 
of this parallel relationship um, of, between cinema and transness going in? Or was that something you discovered as you were pulling old footage of cinemas? Um, I guess this question's a little um, more directed at um, Sam, but both of you can answer. <laughs> Um, that's a that's a great way of asking that question. I haven't quite I haven't been asked it in that way before, and I cut. There's two things that come to mind. I mean, one the the specific framing of it as cinema and transness growing up together that was specifically Susan Stryker. So the framing of it, you know, that comes from a historian, you know, someone who looks at history, you know, in a constructive narrative way. And for me, as a filmmaker, as a documentarian, I, I just look at it differently. Um, so. Where the, the, the angle I was coming from was understanding and knowing that there were deep roots to all the, the shame and the violence and the, the, you know, all the things we had internalized for so long via the representations we had seen in our lifetimes. I knew it had preceded us. I knew it was there, um, but I hadn't thought about it in this way of trans and cinema growing up together. I um, may think what but Susan really solidified for me. And then once I started looking at all these clips in a historical context and trying to see how they related to what was happening off the screen at the time um, and really seeing how, you know, race and gender were such intertwined fascinations, you know, from the get go. And, you know, that, you know, you know my, my work has always been informed by Baldwin and race, class and gender just being, you know, always, together. And so when, you know, seeing that in the history, it was just, it was just, again, just very validating to understand why we walk around with these belief systems, right? And so uh, while it was painful at times to see how early a lot of the, the racism and the misogyny and the transphobia go back, it was, there was also a strange validation to, to it because so often marginalized people are told they're being too sensitive and what they're experiencing isn't real. So there's this moment of like, okay, here's proof, which sucks that we need it, you know, that it's saying our feelings isn't enough, but there was something very validating and empowering to say, okay, here, now you all can see what we've been talking about. Yeah. You're muted. <laughs> oh, I'm gonna make that mistake many times. I'm gonna <laughs> tell you now, um, but yeah, so, yeah, you both bring up um, sort of prioritizing intersectionality in the film, and it's ve and it's very um, it's very forefront of the film. Um, the this intersection between race and transness, and being able to or not being able to, according to media, hold more than one identity. And I'm curious, I'd love to hear you all talk more about um, your personal experiences with that, as well as how you navigated, how you navigated bringing this to the forefront of the film. Um, so, so the question is um, like having, being at intersections of different identities and how we brought that into the film. <laughs> yes. Um, okay, I guess, I mean, I don't know. I mean, for me, you know, it's one thing I always say is that, you know, I'm my identity is is layered. It's not fractions. We're not, it's not fractured, right? And I think that sometimes, you know, um, people have asked of me to be one of something first. Like, you have to be black first, you have to be masculine first, or you have to be trans first, you have to be queer first. And I'm like, no, to hell with that. I'm all of these things. And all of these things together really create a very, like, complex and really type of, of, of beautiful experience. And um, I think it's important to be able to showcase these, these complicated um, experiences of all these, of these different identities um, melting together as a way of expanding what it means to be a human being. So it's, it's, it's just, it's about the trans stories, it's about the media, but it's also about being human. It's also about breaking through this binary system of gender um, because binary systems don't work anywhere. They don't work in, in, in politics. They don't work in our human experience. It doesn't work in space. It doesn't work in time. Like, you know, it's not, it's all about the flow, right? Um, so it's important for me to bring that to, to, to be able to have an opportunity to bring that, um, you know, into media and expand this idea of who we are um, in order to, you know, create space for all of us. Because it's like, well, you can't, 
when we only live inside other people's imaginations, you know, we become monsters, you know, but when we're just left to the whim of people's fears. Um, so it's important that, that that's able to happen. And also so that in black communities, they can see that I can still be black, black and I love black people and I'm down for my folks and I'm still very queer and I'm still very trans. You know what I'm saying? And I can be in trans community, queer community and still be very black. And I love being trans, love being queer and I'm black. Um, you know, and, and also I think it's also about being a model of possibility for like, you know, young folks who may look up to me and even not so young folks who, you know, are experiencing their transness and, and their queerness, um, you know, to say, you know, that, you know, they can see me and see that I, I'm here uh, and I'm queer and I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> I think you just coined a new slogan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think Teak, you have one of those one of those great lines in the film. You know, I think that's it. Really, just you know, yeah. <laughs> when you, you know, just like, what does that say about your queer trans black ass? Like, I think you know, there was another point in the where you said something about throwing out that DVD and it just became a frisbee. I don't know oh. if you remember saying that, <laughs> but we had to take that out for various reasons. <laughs> but I think you know, there's that it's one of those moments in the film where it's so crystallized, it's so clear, right? Yeah. And I think it, and I, I just love it. I love that moment. You're so honest and so raw and, and, and so unapologetic. Thank you. Awesome. And so um, you, you had, you all worked with an entirely trans group of cre filmmakers, creatives, and that is one of the part, that is one of the things of many that make this film so revolutionary. And so tell me about what it was like having a team of exclusively trans creatives um, to work with, to bounce ideas off of, um, to create community with. Um, yeah, tell me a little about that. Yeah, I mean, when I started doing the research on this, um, you know, I looked towards cellular closet and ethnic notions to see how they told these stories. And they're both, both based on books. So I was really overwhelmed and I, I, I'm not a historian and I'm not a trained archivist. So I just, just how am I going to do this? And it's so precarious to tell a history as it is. So immediately I knew that, that I was not going to do this in a vacuum. And I would interview as many trans people that have worked on one side of the camera or the other to start to collect the, the primary resource to then base the film on. Right. So from the beginning, it was just a no brainer that it would only be trans people informing the story. We are the experts in our own history. Um, and I, I just find it so interesting that people, I mean, it's, I think it's starting to shift, but still it's seen because we're still thought as something that is diagnosed, there always is someone who, who's supposed to speak on us, about us as the expert, you know, and just that there was no room for that in this story at all. It just made absolutely no sense to me. So that followed in the actual production as well. So everyone that you see on camera is trans and behind the camera, we prioritized hiring trans people, but no surprise, uh, not, not many trans people have had the experience. So um, when we couldn't hire a trans person in a key role on set, we mentored a trans person. So every non-trans person that was hired took on that. And, and while I was hiring those non-trans people, that was a you know, thorough part of the interview process with them to make sure that not only they would do it, but that they would be excited about doing it and that they were committed and passionate about mentorship, that it wouldn't just seem like, you know, an extra job to them. So we had an incredible cast and crew. Um, our crew was just really sweet. And, and, you know, anytime I would turn around during production on a, on a break, you'd see someone drawing diagrams for someone else on the ground, you know, to kind of show the Griffin Electric Department had to do something different. It was it was really moving. And um, our gaffer was this woman named Desi. Uh, gaffer's a lighting technician. And she's been in the industry for probably 25 years. She's an incredibly skilled gaffer. And she's a white cis lesbian. Um, and she, you know, understood she had a lot of limitations in terms of the community, she, in the trans community. She hadn't worked with trans people. She certainly didn't know anything about her history. And she was so moved by working on this project that she went back to her union, her tech union, and it's called IATSE. It's the largest tech union in the world. And she instituted the first trans sensitivity training. And that was after our first shoot. And that was 2017, right? So that was, you know, three years ago, we were already seeing the impact of this production model. And that's, you know, that's the behind the scenes invisible work, but I'm, that's, I'm most proud of that. I'm so proud that we stuck to our guns because it wasn't easy, um, and if a small indie project can do that, 
a project with studio backing has no excuse. And I just, I really, really, really hope we see this happening, you know, in, in every production, right? Um, we paid everyone that we interviewed, which is also really contested in the documentary world and in funding world. And we paid everyone behind the camera their day rates. And we gave, um, you know, stipends to our fellows. And we got a lot of pushback for that model, for that production model. But I think not only is it the only way I can, you know, be with myself and like live with myself, but I just, I think it is, I think it's infused in the project. I mean, you have to have trans people behind the camera and telling trans stories because only a trans person is going to have these really specific sensitivities that you only have if you have a stake in the game, right? If you have something to risk, you know, um, whether it's a PA, you know, speaking to, you know, the, the, the cast uh, about, you know, where they need something they need to get on set or if it's, you know, someone adjusting the mic and just being sensitive to how they touch someone's body or doing makeup and certain things that want to be, that you want highlighted or not highlighted or how our DP was framing the shot and how the lighting is. I mean, you, there's just things that are going to be missed if you don't have a stake in the game. And so it was essential to prioritize trans people throughout the entire project. And I think you feel it when you watch the film. I really think you do. Yeah. And so I definitely got to, you know, give it up to you for, for doing that. And, you know, I, I can't imagine how hard it was, like the challenges to make sure that everybody was trans and getting everybody paid. But the thing is, is that that's possible. Like as well, just going that extra mile and making it possible. We have to tell the stories of certain groups of people, like being able to model what Sam has done, um, you know, either like exactly or close to it. Because because he's absolutely right. When, when you have something, you have a stake in the game, you're gonna you're gonna make sure that that story flourishes. You're gonna make sure it pops. You're gonna know. You're gonna be able to see the truth of the moment and know how to produce that moment so that it really grabs the audience. So like, that was really dope. Yeah. Thank you, and I appreciate that. And of course, that feels good that acknowledgement. But I also feel like it's a no brainer again, right? Exactly. Yep. It could just be the standard. It really could. It really really could. It really could. That's an incredible. That's incredible. Is that thinking about um, that as a production model, um, and thinking about that as a as a standard that Hollywood or just filmmaking in general should go by? And mm -hmm. I'm curious, was what you were what y'all were thinking when this premiered at Sundance? Was this with a bunch of big Sundance being a bunch of big Hollywood people, um, and a lot of and plenty of them, I'm sure, were see might have been seen in the film um doing something maybe not so great like cisgender actors um playing a trans character well you know sundance is supposed to be independent but you're right is much there's a list there's a big hollywood takeover at sundance um you know going to sundance was on you know it's a dream i'm not gonna lie like you just can't shed that dream when you're making indie films for you know, 20 years. Um, it was a real honor to go there and it, it was very exciting. Um, and it has all the pitfalls that you suspect and, and imagine. Um, we did definitely have a trans takeover. There was 30 of us there and that was awesome. Um, there were some problems, you know, it wasn't the most hospitable environment, but we were there. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the stakes for telling this the stakes for making this film for me are so different than the folks who are in it, right? A lot of the folks in it are actors and they, they, they were taking a lot more risk critiquing uh, the industry than I was. So it was a very different experience. Mm -hmm. um, and with every interview, I fully told people like, if there's something you regret, we'll take it out. Like I'm not interested in making problems for anyone, making anything harder getting in the way of anyone's career. And there were a couple of people that did ask me to take things out after we did the interviews. Um, so it's, it's, it's a very different, I'm just giving this context because the way I'm gonna answer your question is totally different and irrelevant to how it's experienced by the people in it. Um, for me, I, I, don't, I, I wasn't worried about people seeing it and being upset. They, I want them to be, I want them to do differently. I want them to do better. Um, that being said, it was really important to both me and Laverne that no, we don't that we didn't demonize anybody, right? We're not interested um, in, in in just telling people how they're wrong. We want to hold people accountable, and I think and, and we want to do it in a loving, 
caring way. And I think Laverne is particularly skilled at that. And I learned a lot. I learned a lot of that from Kate Bornstein too when I was doing my last project. I mean, that was one of the reasons that I wanted to make a film about hers because she wrote about a controversial film that I was really heated and upset about and she did it with love and, account and accountability. I think that's really important. And it's, you know, the conversations around cancel culture, I think it's, it's much more honest to say it's consequent culture, you know, it's like, we're not trying to wipe people off the map. We're just trying to have these conversations. And it's, I think it's coming to light now that as soon as it's people who've never had to be accountable, when they start to feel threatened, they're saying it's cancel culture. Like, you know, none of these things can be lost on, on the conversations. And what's so beautiful about being able to make a documentary is you're able to spend two hours talking about an issue, but our media, our mainstream media on a daily basis doesn't allow for that time and nuance. Um, so yeah, I, I was thrilled. I was thrilled to be at Sundance and have that platform and to have you know these programmers who I admire so much say this was one of the highlights of their career and that this will change Hollywood. I mean, these are bananas things to say and to hear, um, but it was thrilling. And I, I mean, it's incredibly meaningful. Um, and I hope people also understand that this film was made to have the conversations also come off the screen, right? And to have these conversations and to look at the overlaps and how it's affecting people's real lives. Like it's not just about casting, right? It's also about how are trans people existing and how can trans people survive and thrive off the screen? You know, I, you know, I think that that's one of the things about, about I don't know why, I don't why, know why but, but it's, it's weird, but anyway, um, um, one of the important things about the film is all the conversation that happened afterwards. Um, I'm still getting like DMs and emails from folks from all around the world who are just like, oh, like my entire mind is blown. Like they didn't realize that they were like internalizing or getting all of these really negative in images of trans people and or they didn't realize that trans people just existed in the way that we were on, on, on film, you know, in, in, the, in the documentary. So that has been really important. Like I've had clients reach out to me who didn't know I was trans. That I, you know, when I do leadership and development coaching in corporations, I have a bunch of clients reach out to me like, "Yo, what's going on?" And they were just so, and they were just so, they were just great about it. And family members and people who watched it over and over again, let's say, caught something new that they learned so much. You know, and I think that that is probably one of the most important things for me for the film. You know. Um, was that was it was everything that came afterwards, all the conversation that's still happening. And I think some of the the, the, the best feedback I've gotten is from uh, parents of trans kids, mm -hmm. you know, just so they can understand like what has happened in our media landscape. Because you know, media isn't is about what what creates what it's about entertaining us, but it creates reality for a lot of folks. You know, so them understanding like this really like kind of shitty reality that was created around transgender people and then seeing all of us being able to talk about this and being able to contradict this, I think was really inspiring to so many parents who were scared for their for their kids. You know, um, you know my, my partner has a trans son who's 12 years old. Um, she's, you know, just really enthralled in the film. So it's just, it was just great. It, it really was. I think that the, the, like the aftermath, like the, the afterglow of the film um, has been really, really great. And um, Eliza, I see your question. I'll get to it in a second, but I want to stay on this train real quick of what this film means coming off screen and into our real lives. And I want to um, specifically talk about, um, because on the website, there's a big question, why now? And everything listed under it is, what do you mean, why not now? Um, at a time when there's recent transphobic healthcare legislation, um, bathroom bills, um, and the Black Lives Movement, that um, there's a lot of push in, for inclusivity, um, trying to make sure Black trans lives are not forgotten in, in the entire movement. Um, and so I want, I'd ask you all to talk a little about um, what issues y'all are hoping this what does this fi film, um, sorry, it's 8 p.m. where I am at, at right now. <laughs> but um, what does this film mean for these issues that we're facing today? Uh, you want me to start on that? Okay. Um, 
That's a great question. Thank you. Um, you know, the film is, yes, it's a film about trans representation, but it's also a film about accountability, about historical erasure, about racism, misogyny, trans misogyny, the utility of visibility, the paradox of increased visibility, spectatorship, you know, and our production model, right, which, which deeply influenced the narrative. And I think all of this really connects to this moment that we're in. And, you know, the social uprising is so much about how a community has been systemically oppressed by those in power uh, and with more privilege. And trans people, especially black and brown trans people know that experience so intimately. Um, and disclosure, I think underscores, or I hope underscores how patriarchy, white supremacy, settler colonialism, and capitalism further oppress our most marginalized. And um, it clearly, we didn't know the moment we'd be in when the film came out, but is it a surprise? Like, I think those of us doing this work, like we've been deeply in this for so long. And, you know, in particular, in when I started the film, I was keenly aware that whenever a marginalized community gets mainstream attention, backlash ensues. So in that in, that in itself, you know, that's the, the backlash that has increased over the past few years is not surprising. It's not a, a one-to-one -one relationship that visibility equals backlash, but it certainly influences how people are gonna respond once, you know, there is more visibility. Teek? Yeah, I mean, I think I think that this this film coming out now, I mean, it was it's super important to have this conversation now, but it's super important to have this conversation, period. You know? Um, but I think right now with with uh, social unrest that that's happening, um, and particularly like, you know, this global Black Lives Matter movement happening during Pride Month and these things just kind of coming together, and then this film, I think that there was um I think that there's been an awakening. I think that the movement that's happening now is is transforming it in it being so intersectional. Like us having this Black Trans Lives Matter march with 15,000 people in Brooklyn was mind blowing. And I think that what that's saying is, is that people who need to be in allyship with us, folks who, you know, not saying need to lead the movement, but need to make some sacrifices in order to be in solidarity uh, with us, like let go of the guilt and be in solidarity with us. And seeing all of these things happening, seeing Breonna Taylor getting killed and George Ford getting killed and then COVID, there's just there's a collective trauma and grief. And I think people were just like laying their burdens down. Like, you know what, how can we, we gotta get better. Like I, I gotta figure out how we can get better as a as like a human experience, as, as a nation and as like a global community. Um, and then here we come getting right in there with this film and it was like, boom, this is how you get better. So I think that, I think that people have been, as of late, people are ready to to take it up a couple notches are ready to have a difficult conversation i think there are a lot of folks who are ready to like recognize their own isms and i'm not talking like just like white folks or straight folks like we all got some shit with us you know what i'm saying and i think there's been a lot of folks um who are ready to have that conversation and and disclosure has been a jumping off point for folks um so i think it, like it, it like this is this has been really great to see all of this happening Okay, microphone. Um, and so um, going into, um, oh no, I've been neglecting the chat box. Oh no, please don't fire me. I'm so sorry. I did not know I needed to scroll down. Um, <laughs> so I guess continuing on this idea of moving um, into the, making sure this film moves into the real world. And so, so some questions include um, if, you'll be carrying the the um, production model into the distribution into the distribution phase and if so how um how are we carrying this the production models the distribution phase um how are we carrying that model into the distribution phase well i mean for starters um lies has been working with trans people on our impact campaign uh, and so that's been, you know, part conversation from the get-go. Liza and I know each other for 35 years. We met on the playground when we were 10. And so it was, yeah. And so it was really oh. awesome that we could work on this project together because she came from 17 years of impact production and I came from 17 years of directing. And so we're kind of at this point where we could collaborate and work together. So that was, is, and continues to be really thrilling. And from the beginning, Liza was like, well, I have to have a fellow, like I, if I'm gonna take on this role. So 
She's been working with trans people in distribution. Um, we are also, you know, have a, I think up to, we're almost at like 50 different partners uh, in our impact campaign. And all those partnerships are about how the film can be used end of use to different organizations um, and how we can, you know, how can they can help us promote the film, but we can also amplify the work they're doing. Um, and so for example, one thing we did right after COVID before we knew where our film would land, we didn't know we were gonna be with Netflix until May, right? It was a very quick turnover. And wow. so we were at Sundance, we rolled up our sleeves to get ready to travel all the world, all these festivals I've always dreamed of going to. And then they're all canceled, including Tribeca, which was the most heartbreaking because that's my hometown. Um, but uh, we didn't know where it was gonna go and how are we gonna try to compensate for all this loss of exposure and loss of connections and conversations that we'd be having all over the world. And Liza came up with this great idea for disclosure chats where we were hosted a chat where Laverne would host a chat with someone in a local organization. We were supposed to have one of our premieres and talk about the work they were doing. And specifically, we were talking to groups that were doing work on behalf of trans people for, that were suffering from COVID. So we're really trying, you know, tying in all this, all the, all the issues happening at once. Um, so I think that's just part and parcel of how we'll continue for the life of the film. It's just constantly working with the trans community and amplifying trans voices, in particular black trans voices, as much as possible. Yeah, and take, take screen captures of all the messages you get. I want to see them. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'll send them to you. <laughs> and um, because I'm keeping up with the chat box, Eliza said, love you. <laughs> <laughs> so um, go, uh, continuing going, bringing this um, film, so, uh, Alex Reese asked about bringing this film um, in, onto Netflix. Um, what was the experience going from an environment so focused on trans representation and the trans community to the press tour and taking the movie to a larger, larger hetero cisgender audience? And have you dealt, dealt with any insensitivity? Um, again, so Tika and I can speak about that from such different experiences. Um, you know, it's all been virtual. So I don't know, you know, I've been doing it in my kitchen <laughs> behind my computer. Um, I mean, some of the conversations, a lot of the conversations for the past five years take um, more work in terms of educating around transness and how to talk about the film and the importance of the film. Um, before we were in distribution, when we were our sales agents, we're having conversations with different distributors. Um, our agents came back to me multiple times telling me that distributors said they already had a trans film. Mm -hmm. And then I'd be like, well, what, which film? And, and then they'd say, oh, it was something very similar to Disclosure. I was like, there, there's nothing similar to Disclosure. And then, so they'd say, well, we already have one trans film. We don't want to oversaturate our market. Or they would give an example of another trans film that had nothing to do with this film as an excuse. So it was mind boggling. So not only was it mind boggling that the distributors would say that, but I also just, you know, with my sales team, I was like, you need to go back and explain that that's not an answer, right? So there was a lot of steps um, in educating and pushing back um, that we continue to do all the time. Um, and, you know, it's that fine line of trying not to feel resentful and, and just paying it forward, doing the work that you know you have to do and um, constantly just hum being humble and acknowledging the privilege I have and doing the work. I get tired and I'll have my tantrum in the other room and then come back and just keep doing the work. Um, so it's not been easy. Um, but after some time and a lot of conversations, Netflix is, is the team we have at Netflix is great. There's um, a group at, at Netflix of trans people that I'm in touch with and they're, you know, part of our team. And that's amazing. And I don't know if that would have happened at any other time in history. Um, so that's really, you know, they're in positions of power, they're in decision-making positions, and that's really been awesome. Yeah. Um, thanks, Sam. Um, for me, I haven't, the question was, have I had any like difficult or like conversations with cishet folks or, is that was the question? Yeah, it was like, the question was about moving from such a trans representation and trans community focused um, 
focused mindset to um, taking it to a larger hetero cisgender audience and if y'all had received more in insensitivity from that? Um, I Honestly, I haven't. I, I really haven't. Um, what I have noticed is that, you know, you know, doing this work as, as a trans person, doing, you know, as, as an advocate and writer and, and media maker, the conversation has shifted. The conversation has gotten so much better. You know, and I think that it was, and that was, you know, uh, Sam really did a great uh, job in showing that in the film when he showed like Oprah, you know, years ago having a conversation and then having a conversation later. Um, you know, I remember like, you know, South Park used to be one of my favorite cartoons. And I remember they had the trans episode like years ago uh, when the teacher transitioned and, you know, they had like a penis that grew legs. It was like this wild thing. And then, you know, years later they had another trans episode that was like so much better. So the conversation is shifting, the conversation is getting better and it's getting better because us trans folks are pushing and demanding for the conversation to get better and demanding, you know, the LGBTQ organizations that do, you know, larger work, um, like who are, who are fighting for advocacy to be better. So I haven't really had bad conversations. And another thing, and I'll be really honest, um, I don't really engage with folks who at this point are going to like, who are going to really like give me some like really awful shit about being trans. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's not, I don't have people like that in my life. Like I might get trolled on Twitter. I get some hate mail on Instagram, but these are strangers. But people like in my inner circle, even on my outer circle or my peripheral, my colleagues, my, my associates, people I love, people I like, we're not ever having that conversation. And I've curated my life uh, like that on purpose. Um, you know, as a way of protecting myself in that conversation. And that is a privilege that I have to do that, you know, because some people don't. Some people are stuck in terrible families and terrible churches and stupid schools that they work at an awful job. I don't have those problems and I'm not going to have those problems. So for me, um, I've been very, very deliberate to surround myself with people who are either of like minds or are at least willing to push themselves to be curious or, or around people who are vulnerable enough to want to change and are curious enough to change. But like people who just want to entrench themselves in their stupidity, people who are too fearful to be curious about other people's experience, I don't have people like that in my life. Yeah, just to echo that, like the the only negative response we've had on like in terms of responding to the film has been like really um, laughable comments on social media. Like someone will just write, Ooh, gross. Like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, like, great. <laughs> no, you don't have to like me. That's fine. <laughs> so, like, that's really the extent of it. And that obviously that speaks for itself. Like, it's just ridiculous. And um, so that's really been the extent of it. I, you know, kind of going back to the moment we're in, people are open right now in a way they haven't been before. And people are have the space and time for so many reasons to sit with material and the desire to unlearn what we've learned for so long. And so people are also really giving a lot, giving a lot of feedback and, and, and reflecting what they've learned. And so I think there is this outpouring of support um, because of the moment we're in as well. Yes, yeah, I absolutely 100% just delete the ooh gross commenters I think they're kind of funny. <laughs> La uh, yeah. <laughs> um, you just have to laugh at what little creativity goes into I know, the right? comment. Be a little more clever. Well, actually, um, don't, it's fine. <laughs> but um, so Faith Brown asked, in the context um, in the context of cis individuals playing trans roles. Sometimes they are playing a person pre and post transition. If the poet calls for the actor to play these roles, would the trauma of having to play a character pre transition be too harmful to the actor or actress to have trans representation in the role? We Danish girl, etc. Dot dot dot. That's going to be case by case. It's going to depend on the actor and how they feel about it. You know, um, Scott Turner Schofield, who just got nominated for an Emmy. He was in a film where he was playing a trans guy and they had scenes of the pre-transition, uh, you know, and he put on a, a wig and makeup and a dress, you know? It's like, 
a trans actor can do that, but I think it's up to the actor of whether it's traumatizing or not. Um, yeah. Uh, Teek, do you have thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I agree. I think it's probably up to the, the, the person, to the actor, and maybe the context of the, of the story you know, um, so I remember like when Laverne and um, Orange is the New Black, remember, and they had her her twin brother play, you know, you know, pre Laverne, you know, um, and at that time I didn't know she had a twin brother, so I was like, <laughs> what is going on right now? <laughs> I, I'm so confused. Um, but you know, I think yeah, I think I do. I think it depends on the person, and it depends. It depends on the person. The the story, and I think it also depends on the people behind the scenes, the writer, the director, and how comfortable and how safe this person may feel either either going into makeup to do this pre, it's pretty post language, is kind of weird, um, but like to, to be that person or like, I think it's, it all, really all depends on who is involved, honestly, so. Yeah, when it comes to, when it comes down to casting, I mean, there's certainly the economics and, you know, correcting mistakes of the past and you're just gonna get a better performance with a trans person. But it's so much harm has already been done by the time we get to the casting. So it's like what, what Teek was saying, like the story and the context of, of how the story is being formed is gonna say so much about how this actor, you know, is being cast. Yeah. Um, quick, so coming into the chat, um, Faith Brown, I guess a quote, I guess the real question I'm asking is if a trans person isn't comfortable, is it then okay for a cis person to play that role? Which I would assume is in prioritizing uh, the trans person com person's comfort and safety, um, no. I mean, honestly, and Teek, I, I would love for you to, yeah. to talk about this too, because I think there's a lot of ways to answer this question, but I will never budge um, from my answer until trans people have power in the world. You know, yeah. when we live in a reality when all is not equal, no, cis people cannot play trans people because we, we see how Jen talks about in the film and there's even more reasons, we know this leads to harm. If all was fair in the world, yes, anyone should play any role, anyone can teach anything, anyone can talk about anything, but we don't live in that world, right? Trans people are, are disproportionately underemployed, disproportionately face violence. We know trans women, specifically black trans women are facing an epidemic of murder. When that is the reality we live in, we have to respect that in our stories as well. So it's, it's we, we understand, especially at, you know, the messages we're trying to get through with this film is the relationship between on the screen and real life. So we can't separate these things. We can't separate the power that exists in the world and pretend that doesn't exist on screen. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree with everything that Sam said. You know, um, just people should not play trans roles. There are so many brilliant trans artists and, 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 and actors out there that can play these roles um, to tell their stories. Um, even if you wanna have a, a, having a trans person play the cis role of the pre-trans person, I don't know, err on the side of having trans people in these roles to tell our stories. Um, and that may take a little bit more legwork on, on people's parts, on like casting and producers and directors, but do that work. And I think that, that work is owed to us um, because of all of the misrepresentation. Um, and the misrepresentation that has done such harm. And again, like watching, you know, doing disclosure, you know, I only like saw like my bit, I didn't see the whole thing until I saw the whole thing. And when I saw it, it was just, I would mind, my mind was just really blown at all the stuff that I took in about us and that everybody took in about us. Um, you know, I didn't, I didn't realize how hurtful it was watching the Brandon Teen story, how traumatizing that was. Until I saw it again, and it like you know, like oh shit, like this was this was hard, you know what I'm saying? Or you know, or how amazing it was to see Reno on Jerry Springer. Like I just you know, it just made me so happy, you know what I'm saying? So it's it was um, it was yeah, it was there was just a lot of emotions there, and it, and and that emotions and that range of emotions that I had watching the film, you know, um, makes me really just double down on the fact that we need more of us in our roles. And sit, there's enough stories about cis people doing all kinds of stuff blowing shit up, falling in love, being funny, whatever. Doing all kinds of stuff, do your thing, but the trans role should be for trans people. Yeah. Uh, I echo that. <laughs> um, so um, going going off of that, making, an, making sure there is a niche 
for um not a niche but making sure there is trans representation there are trans stories told um is there sue kennedy wanted to know is there a particular storyline or character in a film or on tv that has been particularly affirming for y'all no <laughs> no no that's so real no <laughs> that's crazy <laughs> nope no. <laughs> Next. Okay. <laughs> All right. That was a quick question. So, so I guess then walking in, the, I'll bring up my own question. Walking on this film, was there, was, is there any particular moment or thing that you learned or story that you learned from someone that you felt was particularly affor affirming? Was there anything about this in the film particularly that was really affirming and disclosure? Um, anything in the film or any any moment you had making the film, walking with um, the cast and crew? I think for, for me, it was it was that whole that whole day was just such a good, good day. You know, um, you know, for me, I was in LA and then I got lost on the bus <laughs> and I was late. So I took the bus the wrong direction and everybody was so cool about it. Um, and, and to get there and to see so many familiar faces of people who I really care about, people that I respect and meeting new people and, you know, just um, Sam's direction and patience. And it was just being there and being a part of, of a family of trans folks doing this work was so affirming and um, just felt really good. You know, it's it feels really good to not always be the only one. And that was one of the, probably the only time where I was not the only trans person or like one of a few trans people a part of a production or, or something like that. So that was the whole, the whole thing for me was, was amazing, honestly. Yeah. Yeah. Similar, very similar to that. I, I hate being the only one. Um, and that I mean, part of the production models because it's really how I want to exist and how I want to work. Right. It's, it's simply, it's certainly a big part of it. Um, and there were these moments on set uh, where, you know, sometimes in the interviews, we blocked off the, the majority of the crew. So it was just me, uh, the person being interviewed, our, our camera A, camera B, um, and then maybe one or two other people. And it was all trans people in that area. And so after a while, you sort of forget that anyone else is there, that anyone's behind the screen. And there are these moments where, you know, our interview, the conversation, something would come up that was kind of like a very trans-specific story or experience, and we all understood, right? We all kind of would sigh in the same moment or laugh at the same, like, really kind of messed up situation, you know? And it was this, this knowing, this knowing that when you have a shared trauma or shared pain or shared experience, that you don't get to experience that often, right, in community. Um, and so that, that was really moving. Um, and special. Okay, and then um, Mika Michaela Gill wanted to ask um, that several in in the film, several contributors mentioned that there was a high representation of trans women in TV and movies, and briefly discuss why that might be. Can you expand on this a bit and tell us why you think trans men are so seldom represented? Teak has a great explanation of this. Yeah, um, I think that the reason, there's a couple of things. I think that women and femininity, like being, being a woman or being feminine, I think in our culture is looked at as it is performative. So there's a ways in which that being a woman or being a feminine person becomes entertaining as, as opposed to it just being a way of being, like a way of being, of being respected as a human being, right? There's that. And I also think that even though, you know, that media is still is looked through through a really like heteronormative male gaze, right? So you have trans women, you have you know, you know trans women who are feminine, beautiful trans women. They're going there's there's a there's a lens that's going to shift to them in a way that it's not going to shift to men. And then I also think that trans men disrupts this idea of what a man in masculinity looks like. And I think being that ninety seven percent of the decisions that are made in Hollywood media are done by cisgender men, there's a space there. There's a disconnect 
Uh, but there's not space for us to come in and say there's an expansion of what masculinity and manhood looks, looks like. So I think that there's ways, I think that there are aspects in our culture and the media that says that we are not ready to have this conversation, but I think that we're getting there. I definitely think that we're getting there. Yeah. And um, there's a few people asking specifically um, to, for us to shift our gaze to think about transness in children's media and children's um, literature. And um, Megan Seedman specifically said that um, they spend a lot of time trying to explain what it means to be transgender to elementary school age children. What kind of images are they seeing and how can these images be improved? Is this a discussion being held in this industry? And Emma Perrazzo, to throw, throw one more question in there um, um, on that topic, how does education for children, how do you all think education for children would need to change and how can the media help with that? Well, I'll say this, I'll say as, a, as a parent, you know, I have a two-year-old daughter. I have a two-year-old daughter. Um, I'm trans. I'm never, there's never going to be a time in my life where I have to come out to my kid. She just knows that dad is trans. And she just knows that like transgender, gender non-conforming, intersex people will exist. So the truth of her life is going to be like, there are trans people, there's trans men, there's trans women, there's people who have pronouns that are they, you know, bodies look different. It's just going to be something that she's going to be raising in the truth that a binary system doesn't exist. So there's never, there's never going to be this moment. And I think that that that's how children should be taught, just that they, that they know, like, this is just a part of life because it is a part of life. You know, I don't, it doesn't have to be something that has to be so, like, disclosed. It doesn't have to be a thing. You know, I was having a conversation with my niece the other day. My niece is five. And um, she was like, and she saw, I guess they found an old picture of me. Like, and now they don't know, like, they don't, they just know Uncle T because they're so little. I've been, I've been, you know, transitioned 13 years ago. So they found an old picture of me. And my niece was like, um, so um, mommy, t uh, I saw this picture of you and mommy told me that Uncle Teak used to be Auntie Tika because he used to be a girl. And I was like, yep. <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> and then that was it. You know, it was like, that was it. You know, so I don't, I don't think, I think when it comes to children, we don't have to overthink it too much. We really don't. Just show them what the, what their truth, what the truth is of the world. And, you know, and, and raise them up in it and they'll be just fine. I have my friend's kid, uh, a, a friend's dad, nephew, or niece, whatever, however that works. My friend's friend's kid, whatever, that he was really close to, trans guy, he's helping raise these kids, and they're twins, a boy, a cis boy, cis girl twin, a sign male, sign female at birth, who knows what they, how they identify now. Anyway, point being is the, the child who was assigned female said to my trans friend, who was a guy, she was like, when I grow up, am I going to be a boy? <laughs> she just <laughs> she's like I don't want to be a boy. <laughs> it's up to you. What if you want it? I love that. So cute, right? Like it's just becoming so part of like okay, this, some people this happens, some people don't. like. I just loved that. It's just, yeah, me just yeah, yeah, me too. yeah. I don't know if that answers the question, but I think it's a it's. How do we all take responsibility of having transness be part of the conversation as much as it is of any gender experience? Yep. Yep. All right. To close out, I'm going to try to fit two questions into a few last minutes. Um, so, what is much like this Q and A? Um, what well, what is one issue, trope, or conversation that you couldn't fit into the documentary? Um, or the rest of this Q and A, um, but you think people should be aware of? Yeah. Oh goodness! Oh gosh, I, I don't even know how to pick just one. Is there anything you felt was missing that you would have liked to have seen explored, Teak? I don't think. I don't really don't think so. Honestly, um, I don't know. I feel like I feel like we really. I mean, I'm sure there could have been more. I mean, I'm sure we could have had a, another hour worth of conversation. I'm sure there were hours worth of more footage, you know what I'm saying? But, and there could have been more there, but I think that the stories that were shared and the films that were shared and analyzed and talked about, um, I think really like did, did what we set out to do, you know? So I don't know. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm happy where the film is. I do, I do know there's so many other people that yeah. I want it to be included in the film. We included 30, which is a lot for a documentary. Um, but there could have been so many more. And 
And they're also, there's so many different types of films. There's so much independent cinema that have deeply influenced how trans people see their lives. But I found during my research that, I mean, I come from the independent world and I actually turned away from mainstream about 20 years ago because I found it so disturbing. Um, and so I had to turn my lens back towards mainstream to make this film. Um, but I initially wanted to include indie and a lot, a lot more documentaries. But as I was doing the research, everything came back to Hollywood and everything came back to these representations. It was what every, it is where the most overlap was, where the collective memory was. Um, so I, I mean, there needs, there can certainly be a disclosure part two using just the material we have, just the interviews we have and the stories that didn't make it in. And I, I collected over 600 television clips and over 400 film clips. So wow. easily a part two on disclosure. But I'm also really interested in what it would be like to have a series, like a five or six part series on the topic, but hire five different trans directors and let them bring their vision to this material and great idea. See where that goes. Um, so that doesn't directly answer in terms of, because I mean, there's so many things that are not part of it. I wouldn't be able to pick just one, um, but I, I'm excited for the opportunities to explore more and more. That's great. That's really great. I love that. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you all so incredibly much. Would you leave us off with three, um, to leave us, finish us off. I know we're like one one minute over time. Would it be possible for y'all to leave us off with a, one or two, um, based on Christopher Beardsley's question, one or two pieces of media or books that have impacted you deeply on, on transness? Transness. Uh, well, you know, um, uh, Jody Patterson wrote a book called Bold World, and it's about a, a black woman whose um, child came to her at three years old and said, she, you know, said the baby, her baby was sad and was fighting and doing other things. And she said, "Baby, what's wrong?" And she said, "And uh, he said, because everybody thinks I'm a girl, mama, and I'm not." And so she writes a memoir about how her child help transform her way of thinking about her own human experience. Um, and now he's 12 years old and he beats me in basketball. So check that book out. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's it for me. What's the name of that book? The Bold World. Bold World, I'm gonna, I'm gonna check Bold it out. Bold World by Jody Patterson, it's really good. The Bold World. Um, you know, I, this is gonna be in a really annoying response, but I, I resist these questions because I feel like I'll leave so many important things out and um, I, I just, it's hard for me. I mean, I, I would be happy to share a whole list of resources but I, I can't just choose one. Uh, but you know what, uh, one general answer would be social media, right? I feel like the trans movement has really made so many strides because of social media. I mean, we know there was a movement in the 70s and 80s and 90s that really picked up and it's kind of been nonstop since then. But social media has given such an uptick and the, the ability for trans people to connect, you know, from such disparate places in the world um, and the safety, you know, that that social media brings, um, I think has been incredibly important and influential. All right, well, thank you so much. Thanks for having us and thanks for being an incredible moderator, Lily. Yeah. All right, thank you all so much. Thank you everyone for coming. Um, yeah, stay safe, wear masks. Um, thank you all so much for coming. Thank you. All right, take care, y'all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.